Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening for this special program. My name is Ann Lacey, and I am the Kansas Collection Librarian here at the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library, and we are very excited to be hosting Dr. Nicole Etchison. Uh, this program was organized in conjunction with the traveling exhibit currently on display at the West Wyandotte Library Gallery uh, called Through Darkness to Light Photographs Along the Underground Railroad. And if you have not seen it yet and you are in Kansas City, I would uh, um, I encourage you to go visit. Uh, we're recording Dr. Etchison's lecture tonight, and it will be available uh, for viewing on the library's website. Just a quick reminder to everyone, uh, cameras and mics should be kept off during the program. There will be time for questions um, at the end, and it, please put them in the chat, and then we will ask them of Dr. Etchison um, at, at the end of the program. Um, so I would like to introduce our guest now. Uh, Nicole Etchison is Alexander M. Bracken Professor of History at Ball State University. She is the author of three books, A Generation at War, The Civil War Era in a Northern Community, which won the 2012 Avery O. Craven Award for the from the Organization of American Historians. Also, Bleeding Kansas, Contested Liberty in the Civil War Era, which was uh, a History Book of the Month selection in 2004 and the Emerging Midwest, Upland Southerners, and the Political Culture of the Old Northwest, 1787 to 1861. She is the recipient of the 2018 Frederick Jackson Turner Award for Lifetime Contributions to Midwestern History from the Midwestern History Association, and she is currently working on a project about suffrage in the post-war, post-Civil War era. Welcome, Dr. Etchison. We appreciate you being with us this evening. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for that introduction, for inviting me. And I want to thank the staff at the uh, Kansas City Public Library for, for making this possible. Uh, as you may have guessed, I am not in Kansas. I'm at home uh, in Muncie, Indiana. Um, so I, I unfortunately have not been able to see uh, this exhibit, um, which is too bad. But I'm glad through the miracle of Zoom, we're able to uh, have have this um, chance to talk a little bit about the history of territorial Kansas. This picture, as you doubtless know, is of the Quindaro site, uh, but I'm going to go now uh, to John Greenleaf Whittier, the uh, New England abolitionist poet, uh, because I, I've taken um, some of my inspiration for this talk uh, from, from the poem that he wrote uh, for righteousness sake, and I'm not going to read the entire poem, uh, but there's uh, a famous line in here where uh, he holds up the free state settlers in Kansas as more uh, righteous than your average northerner who gives six days to mammon and one to cant. So no northerners, uh, New Englanders who talk about doing the godly thing, um, who go to church one day for cant, well, they will talk about righteousness, but most of the time, most of the week, six days of the week, they are serving mammon, trying to make a living. And Whittier certainly presented uh, some of the people I'm going to talk about tonight, such as uh, Free State Governor Charles Robinson, his wife, Sarah, uh, and New England settlers in places like Lawrence, as followers of righteousness of uh, people who are not just acting out of cant and certainly not acting out of greed, but who are really living these anti-slavery principles. And uh, this is a, the line that Whittier draws between mammon and cant on the one hand and actual living out of these principles is a line that historians have kind of drawn as well in a lot of what we write about territorial Kansas or bleeding Kansas. So you have people like Paul Gates who rooted the struggle in Kansas over questions of land policy. And people like me who talk largely about um, political issues. And, and we sort of, historians have sort of drawn this divide as if the settlers in Kansas, particularly the free state settlers, can only be motivated by economic motives or pure anti-slavery mo motives, and that the two are somehow in conflict with, with each other. 
Kafka. And so what I, I'm going to argue tonight is that Quindaro is a very good example of how the two are not necessarily contradictory, that the people like Charles Robinson, uh, who genuinely worked for the free state cause, and in some cases were genuinely abolitionists, were not averse to actually making a living, uh, which is what Kundaro was all about. It was not only an anti-slavery town, important on the Underground Railroad, as uh, the exhibit at the Kansas uh, City Public Library lays out, uh, but it was a land speculation. It was an effort to make money. So I want to go back and perhaps cover some background that's pretty familiar to you, but perhaps not to everyone. Um, Stephen Douglas, as you may know, was the very powerful Democratic senator from Illinois in the 1850s. He was also chairman of the Committee on Territories, the Senate Committee on Territories. Uh, and he was one of a number of people in Congress who had an interest in organizing the territory west of Iowa and Missouri, what on the upper map you should be seeing uh, is labeled the unorganized territory, the northern part of the Louisiana Purchase. Um, Douglas was not the only one who wanted to see that territory organized, so provided with a, a government so that settlers could move out there and start uh, settling in, in that region. Um, certainly, uh, the Iowans had been pushing for um, organizing the northern part of the Louisiana Purchase. They wanted to move into what, what later becomes Nebraska. Uh, the people who were not interested in the early 1850s in organizing that territory were the Southerners, uh, including the Missourians, because under the 1820 Missouri Compromise, the northern half of the Louisiana Purchase was intended to, was forbidden to have slavery. Slavery was prohibited from going into the northern half of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, so Missourians and other people from slave states, particularly congressmen and senators from the slave states had no interest in organizing a free territory that was going to come in as a free state and add to the political power of the Northern Bloc in Congress. And so uh, Douglas, as you may know, got through that roadblock in the winter of 1853-1854 um, by redrafting his legislation, what we know as the Kansas-Nebraska Act, to uh, divide the territory, the unorganized territory, into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska, and to remove, repeal, the Missouri Compromise prohibition of, on slavery going into Kansas and Nebraska uh, and replace it with something called popular sovereignty. And Douglas will actually say that Kansas, Nebraska doesn't repeal the Missouri Compromise, that in fact the 1850 Compromise had already done in uh, the Missouri Compromise, which was kind of a surprise to most Americans. Uh, who had not thought that that is what the 1850 Compromise did. Um, but Douglas, I think, was trying to kind of pull a sleight of hand here when Kansas, Nebraska became incredibly controversial and, and in many ways politically toxic uh, in 1854. So, but in any case, uh, Douglas had a, a hard fight, Douglas and his allies in Congress. Uh, but they got the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed. Uh, they, they lost a big chunk of the Democratic Party, Northern Democrats who were not prepared to swallow popular sovereignty or Kansas-Nebraska. But the legislation passed Congress and you got these two uh, territories. And under popular sovereignty, the idea was that the settlers in the territory will decide whether or not they want to have slavery. And there was a, a ex-congressman in Illinois by the name of Abraham Lincoln who wondered in 1854, how are the settlers supposed to decide? Uh, supposedly this is going to happen at elections, but there are accounts coming out of Missouri that the Missourians are prepared to go into Kansas and vote. 
Uh, and then uh, William Seward, uh, very famously, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed, Congress sort of threw down the gauntlet and said to Southerners, all right, it's going to be a race to see who can get their people into Kansas, and the free states are uh, prepared to win that competition. And so in late 1854 and accelerating into the spring of 1855, uh, you get a lot of Missourians who are crossing uh, the border, and Missourians are sort of naturally expected to dominate Kansas territory. Um, and you got uh, what nobody, I think, really expected was a large number of Midwesterners who were looking for farms as Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, even Iowa starts settling up. Uh, their, their people start going out west. Um, and then what everybody knows about and uh, get perhaps a disproportionate share of the attention are the New England immigrants who are only about 4% of the population of territorial Kansas, but they establish their capital as it were um, at Lawrence, named after Amos Lawrence, one of their benefactors. Um, and Amos Lawrence was a benefactor of the New England Immigrant Aid Company, uh, which was organized to stimulate New England settlement into Kansas territory. And uh, the New Englanders, I think one of the reasons that they're more famous than the Missouri settlers and the Midwestern settlers is that the New Englanders did propaganda really, really well. Uh, so they wrote songs about why they were moving to Kansas. And as I said, they organized immigrant aid companies and they put out flyers. Uh, so their numbers were small, um, but nobody had really expected anyone from Maine or Massachusetts to be going all the way out to Kansas. So this was kind of a shock, uh, particularly to the Missourians. Um, and so the song of the Kansas immigrants, um, another, one of these songs uh, that was heralded as part of the free state migration in 1855, um, the song of the Kansas immigrants is another Whittier uh, production. And I, from it, I take the title of this presentation where he writes, we crossed the prairies as of old, our fathers crossed the sea to make the West as they the East, the homestead of the free. So this idea of the homestead of the free um, captures the anti-slavery purpose that was behind a lot of the New England uh, migration. The new, the, my fellow Hoosiers back in the 1850s were not singing songs about going to make Kansas free. They weren't singing songs about moving to Kansas at all, but if they had, they would have sung songs about getting a farm. And but Whittier is talking about rearing a wall of men on freedom's southern line, um, go to test the truth of man, uh, truth of God, excuse me, against the fraud of man. So these high minded purposes. Um, now, I don't think this is a ruling uh, principle or a dominant theme in the Song of the Kansas Immigrants, but Whittier does use the word homestead. And homestead is exactly what, what uh, Missourians would have been looking for. And these Midwesterners, you know, homestead is a farm. It is a livelihood. It is uh, a place to establish self-sufficiency. And in, in the practice of 19th century pioneers, uh, eventually move from self-sufficiency to the market economy. The idea is not to stay in the log cabin or the sod house. Uh, for forever, it is to build that nice clapboard house two story that shows you are a market farmer. So there is an economic underlying, uh, even in Whittier's anti-slavery poetry. And um, certainly the New Englanders, uh, behind all of this propaganda, if you read their letters, uh, they talk about the necessity of, of making a start, of getting a farm. Um, if, is, as I've said, uh, the Midwest is already filling up and has more 
ambitious young men who need to start out than it has land for them. If that is true of Indiana in the 1850s, it's certainly true of Massachusetts or Maine or the other New England states. And you can look at these letters in the 1850s and you can see that. Um, then of course, we, the reasons for the migration, but as, as Lincoln talked about, uh, we have the issue of what's going to happen on the ground. How is popular sovereignty going to work? Stephen Douglas certainly said, there should be no problem. And Douglas will go to his dying day in 1861 saying that popular sovereignty is nothing more than the great principle of American democracy. And I can't roll my R's uh, to really carry this out, but Lincoln evidently by the late 1850s was satirizing this great principle of American democracy by rolling out as a great principle of American democracy to, to kind of make fun of, of um, Douglas. And, and I imagine it, of course, we don't have any recordings of Lincoln doing this, but uh, some of us may remember the old Tony the Tiger serial commercials of our youth, the great um, principle of democracy as, as Tony the Tiger used to do it on, on TV. Um, and part of Lincoln's point was, you know, Senator Douglas says this is the great principle of American democracy, nobody, nobody doubts. Um, that the voters will is the great principle of American democracy. Um, but as, as Lincoln would have many opportunities and, and others of this new Republican party would have many opportunities to point out, the great principle of, of American democracy didn't work so well in Kansas territory. And our generation is unfortunately familiar with uh, contested elections, disputes about who won, was there, was not, they're not fraud. Um, and this certainly played out in Kansas territory. Um, so on, on the left, uh, what you see is an image, uh, a drawing of Missourians crossing the river to vote in March of 1855, which was the election of the territorial legislature. And it was well documented at the time that Missourians came over, they were organized in parties, they were uh, dispatched by their captains to different parts of the territory um, to vote, and uh, that many of them then went back to Missouri. Um, and the, the stipulation in the territorial um, legislation was that you had to be an actual settler in the territory. And the Missourians said, well, nobody um, asked me if I was going, you know, if, if I was going to be an actual settler just today or longer than today. And I'm an actual settler today. And to give the Missourians uh, some credit, many of them intended and many of them did move over into Kansas. They just hadn't quite moved yet. Uh, but nonetheless, there were a lot more voters at that first uh, big territorial election um, than there were residents in the territory. And that, that was quite, quite clear and well documented. Um, the picture on your right, drawing on your, on your right, uh, actually comes from uh, 1857 um, elections and showed another version of fraud, which was pro-slavery legislators um, lining up and voting more than once. You vote and you see them switching their hats and sometimes changing coats um, as they get in line to get a dram of whiskey and then they get back in line and they vote again. And so in some of the elections in 1857, 1858, you saw these inflated voter rolls from tiny little hamlets in, in Kansas territory that had a half a dozen shacks uh, so how they could have turned out a thousand voters, that was, of course, it was, it was totally fraudulent. So the result was that um, Kansas ended up with um, competing governments, 
And you guys probably don't need this map, but uh, here in Indiana, I use it uh, with my students. Um, so you had a Lecompton, which was the official territorial capital, um, which had a, for, for most of uh, the territorial period, had a pro-slavery legislature. Uh, it had men who were elected, particularly in that March 1855 election where the Missourians crossed over and vote, voted. Um, the Midwesterners and the New Englanders teamed up in 1855 to uh, create an extra legal, um, the administration of President Franklin Pierce would have called it an illegal and treasonous uh, government, but I prefer the term extra legal for the free state government uh, that wrote a constitution, established its um, capital at Topeka. So you had uh, in 1855 uh, and continuing into 1856, uh, two different governments. You had the government, the pro-slavery government that the federal government recognized in Lecompton, and you had this extra legal free state government, um, the Topeka government, which the federal government considered treasonous, and uh, that, and the Topeka government, the free state movement, of which Charles Robinson uh, was governor, did not recognize the authority of the Lecompton government. And this, this is a recipe for trouble and trouble broke out in the spring of 1856 and a series of events that are probably familiar to people on the border. Um, the territorial posse that went in to make arrests in Lawrence and then when it was disbanded, demolish the town in what free staters and the Republican press will call the sack of Lawrence uh, back in Washington, DC. At the same time, you have uh, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts making a virulent vitriolic speech about the uh, events in Kansas, the affairs in Kansas, uh, in which Sumner insulted a South Carolina Senator whose nephew happened to be a congressman, then came onto the floor of Congress and beat, literally beat Charles Sumner senseless. So you had the bleeding Kansas and bleeding, bleeding Sumner. Um, and also very close on the heels of the sack of Lawrence and the beating of Sumner, uh, John Brown, the Kansas settler went out with some of his followers uh, into the countryside around Pottawatomie Creek and uh, they killed five pro-slavery settlers. And that was the, the Pottawatomie massacre is what really set off uh, the fighting. So this, this photograph of free staters with a cannon is one of the iconic images. Kansas territory dissolved into bloodshed in the summer of 1856, the period that we call Bleeding Kansas. And uh, the Democrats had to, uh, the Pierce administration had to send in a new territorial governor, uh, a giant of a man, well over six feet tall, uh, John Geary, who was a veteran of the Mexican War. He was a veteran of the of Gold Rush San Francisco. Um, and Geary restored order in time for the presidential election in the fall of 1856. So one of the things um, that happened in the summer of 1856, Charles Robinson, as I mentioned, he was a Fitchburg, Massachusetts doctor who had migrated to Lawrence. He worked as an agent for the New England Immigrant Aid Company. His wife, Sarah, was one of the big propagandists of Bleeding Kansas. She wrote a, a book about the Kansas Civil War that was well known in, and very influential um, in the East. Uh, Robinson was put in jail along with a number of other free state leaders in the summer of 1856. He was, he was the free staters and their allies in the North would have said a political prisoner. Um, he was one of the treason uh, prisoners whom ultimately the Pierce administration held in jail for most of the summer and into the fall of 1856, uh, but then released um, and eventually dropped uh, prosecution. But 
um, Whittier's For Righteousness Sake was actually written about these political prisoners, such as Robinson. These were the treason prisoners. Um, so this is the background of all the, as I said, high-minded anti-slavery part of the Kansas drama. And that part isn't over uh, when Robinson is released from prison in 1856. Uh, but I do want to switch now to the mammon side of the story, or at least the, the economic uh, part of the story. Um, Robinson was a principled abolitionist and a woman's rights supporter in many other worthy causes or causes we would now consider worthy. Uh, but he also came to Kansas to make a living. He, he worked for the immigrant aid company. That was, that was part uh, of a, a job uh, in settling in Lawrence. And not long after he was released from prison, uh, he approached another free stater, a man by the name of Abelard Guthrie, uh, whose wife, Nancy, was uh, a Wyand, member of the Wyandotte tribe. And Robinson was interested in a land speculation. Um, and the Guthries, with their ties to the Wyandotte, um, made it possible to get access to Wyandotte land uh, on which Quindaro would be settled. And Quindaro, um, Nancy uh, is also known as Nancy Quindaro Guthrie. Uh, and Quindaro, we are told, means a uh, bundle of sticks in the, in the Wyandotte language. Um, so the idea was uh, that this Wyandotte tie uh, made it a good name for the location and also the free staters liked this idea of a bundle of sticks of unity under pressure as they had been fighting against these pro-slavery forces uh, backed by the federal government. But basically Quindaro was a land speculation. It was a town site and uh, the Adelaide Guthrie, Charles Robinson and others um, were partners in a land company. Um, each was to receive 10% of the profits. Um, they divided up lots. There were a certain number of shares that were going to be sold to merchants and um, residents of the territory. Uh, the price was $150 per share. And then they were going to market uh, lots and shares in the company. So this is a, a money-making ma speculation. They picked Quindaro, uh, despite what's famous to us now, uh, that is very high up the bluff, very steep. Um, so later on, we can look back and say, oh, that was a, I, I have walked up that bluff, and I, that's a difficult climb. Um, so people have said that was perhaps not the best location. Um, but it was a considered a good position uh, between Kansas City and Leavenworth, um, where they thought steam companies would stop. Uh, there's a, a rock ledge there um, that Robinson and the town founders thought uh, would be suitable for disembarking. Um, and as was the style in the 19th century, this is not just true of Quindaro. It is, and it's not even just true of Kansas territory. It is true of probably everywhere in America in the pioneer period. Someone goes out, they lay down a, they put in a stake, they say, I'm founding this town and it's going to be the metropolis of the West, the Athens of the West of the Missouri, the, the Venice, whatever. Um, it's, going, it's going to be the great metropolis. And they make up maps like this one that O.A. Bassett did with an image of Nancy Quindaro uh, Guthrie up in the corner and laying out this elaborate, huge town um, that bears no relationship to what is actually on the ground. You, you see all these maps for almost every proposed town um, in the United States. And so it was supposed to have a cemetery. 
uh, this layout of streets, parks, churches, schools, a court square, um, a literary society. And, and these maps are, are part of the effort to attract settlers. Um, so this kind of elaborate propaganda, again, is totally typical of town founding in the era. It also, excuse me, coincides with the songs about uh, common schools on the distant prairie swells um, filling Kansas territory, um, the Sabbaths of the wild with the music of church bells, all this kind of rhetoric that you find in Whittier and what others are writing um, is embodied in this map. Quindaro was also supposed to be, shall we say, a experiment in social justice. Uh, it was also billed as part of the pro uh, propaganda that this was a free state town on the Missouri, that this was a town that stood for certain principles, not just anti-slavery, uh, but women's rights, and Quindaro was supposed to be a temperance town. And we often forget because for us in the 21st century, uh, we understand anti-racism, we understand anti-slavery, we even understand women's rights as important issues. Uh, but these people were also uh, temperance, anti-alcohol advocates, uh, most of them. So if you were if you were in this sort of wing that opposed slavery, uh, that advocated radical causes like women's rights, um, then you, you were also a temperance advocate. And so Quindaro was supposed to be a temperance town, an anti-alcohol town. Now, all of these, these kinds of speculations, these, these town founding speculations are inherently risky. Robinson and the other town founders um, believed and said that the location on the river would bring in immigrants because uh, the Missouri River was simply how you got into Kansas territory uh, for much of that period. You came through Missouri on the river and then um, up into Kansas territory. Uh, they also, however, were very hopeful, like all 19th century Midwesterners um, or in the rest of the country, uh, they wanted railroads. So at the bottom of this elaborate map, uh, you see the main railroad routes that they are uh, prospecting will come into Kansas and Missouri. Um, so these are prospective routes, not necessarily existing routes. And one of Robinson's jobs, he spent some time um, in the late 1850s uh, lobbying in Washington, D.C. for the route that was supposed to connect Quindaro to other major towns, something called the Missouri River and Rocky Mountain Railroad. But he didn't get it. And some people have faulted uh, Robertson, Robinson for being somewhat opportunistic because when it became clear to him he was not going to get the railroad through Quindaro, um, he went then went to work for another railroad, the Leavenworth, Pawnee, and Western, which later became the Union Pacific. Again, uh, because that that was the route that was going to be successful, and that was where one one could make money, um, but. Uh, rail, getting the railroad route, it, th that's make or break for these towns. They all say they're going to be uh, the Athens of the West and they're going to be on the railroad route. And if they don't get the railroad route, that is very, very bad for development. And that is indeed what happened with, to Kandara. The railroad goes elsewhere. Um, the Town founders, uh, this business of selling shares, uh, of attracting outside investors, which they need to do. If you read the correspondence, um, which is up on uh, the Kansas Historical uh, Society's uh, Territorial Kansas online page, um, 
it gets pretty predatory. Uh, Thaddeus Hyatt, the Eastern abolitionist who had been a propagandist for territory, free state Kansas um, and uh, an advocate uh, of Kansas, uh, Kansas settlement, um, there, there are some letters from some of the Quindaro uh, town speculators uh, that they are, are they are just salivating at the idea of hooking Thaddeus Hyatt into this speculation. Samuel Samuel Pomeroy um, says the hawks about Quindaro uh, think they have caught a pretty bird in Thaddeus Hyatt. They are determined to pick him. Um, and this was Pomeroy uh, commenting on, he thinks Robinson sort of going after Robinson and others going after uh, Hyatt, um, Pomeroy and, and Robinson detested each other. Uh, but that, that's not the only uh, allusion in these letters to, to courting and sometimes preying on Eastern investment uh, investors. Um, as, as what I said about Pomeroy and Robinson's dislike for each other indicates, uh, this, the town's founders uh, became somewhat contentious. Um, there's a lot of criticism of Robinson. Eli Thayer, who founded the New England Immigrant Aid Company, uh, thought Robinson was favoring his own business interests over that of the Immigrant Aid Company. Um, Robinson said the company was favoring Pomeroy over him. Uh, Guthrie gets really angry because he thinks another member of the town company, S.N. Simpson, is selling lots that he doesn't have the title to, putting lots that he bought for other people in his own name, and essentially um, carrying away funds belonging to the Quindaro company. In other words, embezzling from the Quindaro company. Uh, and, and Guthrie thought that if anyone deserved a uh, life uh, sentence of the penitentiary, it was S.N. Simpson. Uh, Guthrie also said that Robinson had used up the company's money, uh, which he calculated at about $100,000, um, that Robinson had spent money too lavishly on works such as road building uh, that were worthless as they were shoddily built, and that Robinson had spent money on transactions the company had not authorized. Um, Guthrie will have a tremendous grudge against Robinson after the town fails. And their dispute went into arbitration, which Guthrie lost. And Guthrie blames that on Robinson being better connected uh, than he was and lying through their teeth during the, during the arbitration. So they are not, not getting along. Um, nonetheless, there, there was a time when it seemed that Quandaro might furnish Eastern investors did buy town lots. Uh, streets were being built. Um, buildings and businesses were being constructed. Steamboats were landing and bringing immigrants. At its height, the town had about 600 people. Uh, it had a hotel, it had stores, and most famously, it had a newspaper the Quindaro Chindawan um, that was edited by the uh, women's rights advocate, uh, Clarina Nichols, a Vermonter. Uh, the town also had a sawmill, it had lumberyard, it had churches. Um, and uh, although Clarina Nichols is mostly known for her adv that advocacy of women's rights and temperance and abolition, um, she was also a very good town booster. And uh, in the Chindawan, she was constantly talking about the building of the town. So she has one piece where she writes, Mort, Jemmy, more Mort. Um, and she is uh, putting down the calls of the builders, mortar, more mortar, Jemmy. She says, Mort, Jemmy, more Mort is the frequent call of the Masons that they add stone to stone and carry the walls higher and higher. Reader, we have watched the progress of these masons day after day as if they were building a tower by which we might scale heaven. Now, the town founding and this building uh, occurs during the period that's known, here's a, a photo of, of Nichols. Um, this is going on uh, in 1857, first part of 1857. 
And at that time, the political controversy in Kansas territory is over the Lecompton Constitution. Back in Lecompton in the summer of 1857, a constitutional convention met and for reasons, uh, mostly because the, the free staters no longer trusted the elections and therefore boycotted them in 1857, uh, the constitutional convention that meets in Lecompton is overwhelmingly pro-slavery. Um, and it writes a constitution uh, that pretty much makes it impossible to keep slavery out of Kansas. Um, nonetheless, Robinson says in the fall of 1857, political matters are comparatively quiet and I have less anxiety than usual. Um, so this, a lot of this um, little Compton controversy, which is occurring in the territory and is certainly by the winter of 1857, 1858, dominating uh, national news is kind of in the background of Quindaro. They're going ahead with their settling, their building. Um, during this period, they put in a major avenue. Uh, they ask uh, for a city charter. Um, and they are also going to vote uh, in these disputes over Lecompton. Le um, and so my point here is that Quindaro is undone not by the political problems that Kansas still has in 1857, 1858, and that are not going to be resolved uh, really until the winter of 1860, 1861. Um, but really what happens to Quindaro is that there's a major financial panic in the East. On the top, you see uh, an image of, of the sort of somber scene on Wall Street at the start of the Panic of 1857. Uh, below you see a, a editorial cartoon from the period of the unemployed workman with his tools scattered on the floor, um, his work box, his, uh, if you, can, you can read what the child in brown is saying, I'm hungry. Um, the rent collector is at the door. He's unemployed. He can't feed his family. He's on. They are on the verge of, of eviction. Uh, so this this was the worst downturn in U.S. history to that time. Um, worse than the Panic of 1837. It won't be as bad as the Panic of, of the 1870s, but it was a very severe downturn in 1857 and uh, ec economic, uh, the United States economy did not recover until, until the Civil War. Um, so back in Quindaro, they noticed with the panic that speculating fever begins to subside. They can't get investors. Uh, the boom continues a little after the panic, uh, but then they begin to talk about it's rather dull here. They can't sell the shares um, at any price eventually. Uh, they, even though with the unemployment, uh, Quindaro town speculators are still saying, well, the unemployed should just come out here to Kansas. So maybe we'll get more settlers because of the panic. Uh, that does not happen. Um, because the unemployed don't have the money to get out to Kansas. Um, investors, as I said, can't, can't sell lots. They can't sell shares. Um, they talk about capitalists in the East uh, who they cannot no longer get investments from. Uh, the town company runs out of money for building roads. Uh, the newspaper ceases to publish. Um, the houses that they're building are empty, can't be rented or, or sold. Uh, by fall of 1858, people are giving up. They are moving out. Uh, they're going to Kansas City or other settlements. Um, and by 1859, Abelard Guthrie says that Quindaro is as dead as pickled herring. This is not unusual. Um, Thousands of towns are founded. James Shortridge, uh, the historical geographer, said um, that thousands of towns were founded in Kansas alone, and only a few of them survive at all, certainly in the West. This is a very common saga. 
uh, and you can date land speculation down back to George Washington, if not earlier. Um, but I, I would reiterate these kinds of economic speculations um, were not incompatible with these free state ideals. Um, material development, the free staters thought, they, they came to Kansas to develop it and to make a living from it and to make a homestead and a livelihood, as well as to save Kansas for freedom and to uh, instill New England institutions such as schools and churches and to carry out their values of, of temperance and anti-slavery. So when the migrants sang of exalting the ideals of liberty, they called Kansas a homestead, um, demonstrating this emphasis on making a livelihood and the intertwined nature, I would say, of these ideals of freedom and capitalist profit. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, and then uh, Anne and her staff are, are going to funnel questions. I hope, I hope we have some, but thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we do have some questions that came in. The very first one is about the pronunciation of the town, Quindaro versus Quindaro. Uh, I think some people here have always heard Quindaro. Um, is there a, a correct way or incorrect way of pronounce, pronouncing the town name? Well, I'll defer to you native Kansans. Um, so we'll just call that a Hoosier accent. <laughs> Um, there's also a comment about um, how important it is to include the voices of uh, indigenous nations who are removed to the, these regions, uh, the, the Kansas territory and, and areas that were being settled either um, the, and the voices of those people that were here originally or were removed from other places. Yes, and uh, a very good book for that, I think. Um, and that is something that a lot, a lot of uh, those of us who write about the Kansas Civil War don't do as much of, uh, but Kristen Tegmeyer or tell uh, her book Bleeding Borders uh, has re really done that, and and it's even um, oh my ten or, or so year, years old, uh, but I, I think it's the one that that does the most uh, to include um, Indigenous history. Uh, there are also a couple of questions about the map that you showed um, with the, the Kansas and Missouri map. Uh, why was St. Joseph shown on your map? What is the importance of St. Joseph? Um, really doesn't have any importance. Uh, <laughs> I think that map comes from a, uh, a, I'm trying to remember who the publisher of that uh, book is. Um, so I don't really talk about uh, St. Joseph much, but uh, it is a map that, you know, it shows, uh, particularly for my students who don't know the geography of the Kansas-Missouri border very much, uh, the important places are Lawrence and Topeka and Lecompton. Also, uh, Westport was shown on the map, and uh, there's a comment that Kansas City, Missouri was well established at that time. Why was Kansas, why is Kansas City, Missouri not shown on the map? Um, as I said, it's just a, a very cursory map uh, that I use largely in uh, lectures on, on the border. And as I said, that are aimed at students in Indiana who don't, don't need to know um, all the locations along the border. They just need to, to know two or three. Uh, there also were a couple of questions about the Underground Railroad. And can you speak to the importance of the Underground Railroad in the, Quind or in the uh, Quindaro Township? Uh, yes, I mean, Quindaro had um, a significant African-American community. Um, and it was known as a site on uh, the Underground, Underground Railroad. And uh, by that time in the kind of whole uh, border, border dispute, um, rather oddly, it seems to me, and I don't know that I have the answer, 
uh, for this, but for Missourians, most of their animosity um, is directed at Lawrence. Uh, they, they, and, and that may be because uh, the height of the fighting between Missourians and uh, pro-slavery settlers in Kansas and free state settlers in Kansas um, is in 1855 and 1856 before Quinn Barrow is founded. Um, and it is therefore uh, Lawrence that is targeted as the, what the Missourians called an abolitionist uh, hellhole. Um, so you find in, on the Missouri side, a lot of talk about Lawrence and of course it's Lawrence that keeps getting sacked uh, both in 1856 and then again during the Civil War. Um, and there seems to be, Quindaro seems to fly a little bit under the radar um, on the Missouri side. So there's a, an African-American community uh, there are notorious abolitionists who live in the town, and Quindaro is, is certainly a place where people are are using to cross over into um, uh, Missouri, and that seems to escalate during the Civil War itself. Um, certainly during the 1850s, African Americans in Missouri were, were self-liberating by crossing over into Kansas. And in 1855 and 1856, you aimed for Lawrence because that was the well-known abolitionist town where you would find shelter and allies. Um, but you, you see it then more by the end of the 1850s and into the 1860s um, going through Quindaro. All right. Um, there is another question. I've heard stories that the Union Army used and somewhat destroyed the town at one time, contributing to its demise. Is this correct? Uh, yes, they did um, quarter troops. And now the town was, I don't, I don't know what the numbers were, but the height of the population uh, would have been about 1858, late 1857, 1858. Um, so by the time you get to the Civil War and you get uh, Union troops there, um, there are some empty buildings. Um, and, and yes, uh, you know, having Union troops quartered there is probably, probably not good. Um, but I wouldn't credit the Union Army with sort of destroying the town. The, the town was very much struggling by, by the Civil War. Um, it, it, it was not going to recover uh, from, from its peak in the, the late 1850s. Uh, someone else says, I live in Quindaro and it's a vibrant Black community now. Um, can you speak about uh, Black historical figures and their relationship to the Underground Railroad? Um, it is not something that I know um, a great deal about specifically with that location. Of course, Western University was there, which was one of the first um, all Black um, institutions of higher uh, education and laid the foundation uh, for that, that community. Um, and, and when Western uh, went under, uh, I believe in around World War II, um, that, that was again, a, a further blow to the town. Um. So here's another question. If there were thousands of proposed towns in Kansas alone that started and collapsed in this way, is there something about Quindaro that makes it uniquely worth learning about and remembering? Um, yes, uh, I, th I think one, one of the things that makes um, Kansas, of course, different from other Western states uh, is, is that it may be the, you know, the only one that's uh, sort of has the sort of grand uh, utopian underpinning. Um, although, as I said, a lot of people are coming 
for nuts and bolts reasons of making a living and establishing a farm, um, including you know, exodusters, settlers who come um, after the Civil War and go out to places like Nicodemus. Um, they, they too hoped to make a living uh, in Kansas. Um, but Kansas also has this uh, place in the great anti-slavery saga of US history, um, which, you know, I, I can't think of, of another place um, on the American frontier that you can really say, you know, this was, this was founded uh, as an answer um, to one of the great evils of American history. Um, so if, as John Brown believed, um, slavery was the fundamental American sin, um, and as Lincoln believed that it was a cancer, um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was, was seen at the time as a great triumph for the slave power because you had a, a chunk of the West of territory that had been consecrated to freedom where slavery was not supposed to go and the slave powers are seized that back and said, now we're gonna have popular sovereignty and you can have slavery there. You don't have to have slavery there, but you can have slavery there where before you couldn't. Um, so the, the New Englanders and even the Midwesterners eventually joined in uh, this project and certainly uh, African-Americans who um, went into Kansas territory seeking freedom, uh, they all joined in this enterprise of, of creating what Whittier called Freedom's Southern Line uh, to, to create, to save Kansas territory uh, for freedom. Well, that's the end of the questions in the chat. Does, does anyone else have any other comments or questions before we wrap things up? Well, I, th I think that we've come to the end of our questions. So I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Edgerson, for joining us tonight and for the presentation. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, feel free to email me with any questions or comments. And if, if anybody has questions afterwards, and I can pass those along. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.